This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Hey, this is Jeremy Jung for Software Engineering Radio. Today I'm speaking with Michael Chan. Michael Chan has been teaching React since 2013 and is the host of the React podcast. He currently works at Ministry Centered Technologies as a front-end architect. I'll be speaking with Michael about React, when and how to introduce it, and navigating the React ecosystem. Michael, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you so much for having me. You have such a wonderful lineup of guests on this show. I feel very honored to be sitting here and talking with you today. Awesome. First, I want to start with defining what React is. So in, in your words, what is React? Oh, man. Ooh, coming out with the big guns right off the bat. So React is a view library, effectively. So it's a, a tool for building out user interfaces. Uh, so managing that view layer, and they give you one tool, which is the component. And you can con- define components to make complex trees of elements or just wrap simple elements. They're pretty similar conceptually to web components, but they're very different. Everything happens in React. They're all managed by React. And um, effectively, they've done a lot of magic to be able to make programming in React very declarative. So you create a tree just in the same way that you create like a HTML tree of elements. And uh, you tell React, hey, insert this at this node. And from that point on, React takes control over everything, all of the updates. So, you know, when state changes and all that kind of stuff, it will very wisely and selectively make updates to the DOM kind of very surgically. And um, it it all comes together and it sounds, you know, I've I've given a very complicated introduction to it, um, but it's all very simple. It feels a lot like writing HTML in JavaScript And just having all of those uh, updates happen like really quickly, getting this really nice model for defining your own types of elements. And it's um, it's great. But yeah, mostly just a view library. You were talking about how it has a declarative interface. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of go a little bit more into that? Like, how does that look compared to traditional web development, working with the DOM and things like that? Yeah, so this is a very different kind of mindset from web components. And I'd say that this is one of the biggest differences between React and web components is web components is very imperative. You know, when you define a web component, you're handling everything, you're telling you're you're telling the DOM how to actually do the mutations to update itself. In React, there's this one function at the bottom of your application and it will mount your React application, however big that is, into a single node on the DOM. And so usually the way React app looks is you'll have like an HTML file and it'll have uh, just a single div with like ID root in it. And that's where React is going to to render your application. Now, this can be something as simple as Hello World or a to-do app or a full-blown application. So this could be like Facebook.com renders a React app into that node. And the the difference with React is is that you get to think about your application at like any given point in time. So because React manages all of the state for you, the best way that I found to describe it is it feels a lot more like when we have written server-side applications in the past, there's that kind of feeling where it's like, I am going to click this button and I'm going to make a request to the server and then I get a whole page back right? Uh, it's very similar to that, but it happens all on the client. So you, you click a button and then React is going to do whatever action it was that, you, you know, that button does. It's going to redraw the full application, but instead of like reinserting it into the DOM, which could be dangerous because you'd lose like input state, you'd, you know, if you had any transient forms filled out, anytime you updated, focus would get lost and all that bad things would happen, right? Um, React just very carefully says it it looks at, you know, what has changed and what is currently in the DOM and says, okay, these two things are different. So we're just going to insert those. This one thing down here in the corner, it's not there anymore. So we're going to take that out. And it does the minimal change set to, uh, 
to update the DOM for you. So instead of you saying like, okay, do all of those things like input, uh, insert this, insert this, remove this, React just does all of that for you. And it's just like, you're just writing a view, just given the state that you have, and uh, you just think about it in terms of like what's happening at exactly uh, any given moment. And um, I think that's the main difference between like, you know, declarative and imperative is how much do you have to tell the DOM to do? If I understand correctly, if we had, let's say, a list of names in traditional DOM development, uh, if we wanted to add a new name to the list, mm -hmm. we would have to find the DOM element that has all of these all of these names in it, and we would have to find it by like an ID mm -hmm. or a class name, and then we would append a new DOM element to the end after we found the correct element we wanted to append to, right? Yep, yep. And in React's case, we would have a component, and that component, it would take in a parameter that would be that list of names, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say Michael and David, that's currently in the list. So we pass in Michael and David as a parameter, and then React would figure out what HTML to output to the browser based off of what we passed in, right? Yeah, so you would still define the the HTML that, that's going to get used. Um, but then, yeah, uh, React would kind of uh, decide how how any updates to that happen. So if you you you, you write, render it first with with Michael and David and then something happens, you know, so now we add Jeremy to the list, it will now rebuild that that list. But instead of pulling that whole list and inserting a new list, which could could be very large, right? You could have maybe hundreds or thousands of items in that list and that would be very slow. Um, it'll say like, OK, we already have Michael and we already have David. Um, so we're adding Jeremy. So we're just going to do an insertion for Jeremy. And, um, you know, if you were programming this, yourself you would you, you would have to take take efforts to make sure that that happened so that it was you know performant but in react's case they've they've abstracted away all of that and it just uh it just kind of works like magic exactly like you would uh, want it to and the way that you write the html within the react component is using something called uh, jsx so could you kind of explain a little bit about what jsx is and how that works yeah, JSX is one of the weirdest things ever. I it's it's like a really weird like demonic HTML. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it looks a lot like HTML. It is an XML syntax for writing functions, um, which sounds really weird. But what it, what it is is it allows you to write that style that like HTML, XML type of style for these elements in React inside of JavaScript. So React happens all in JavaScript land. Unlike libraries like Vue or um, I think Angular still does this, definitely Ember, there are no templates. So, you know, in the past we've had like handlebar template or even currently we have a uh, handlebar templates or, you know, a Vue template and they are effectively just strings of HTML and there are these little you know areas where we can interpolate things and when we compile our um, our data to our, our view templates those get get rendered out and inserted into the DOM now react is totally different it all happens in in JavaScript there's no kind of like compiling view templates and when you create components you're returning react elements and these are just templates for actual DOM elements. So you're not returning DOM elements, you're returning React elements. And they tell React how to draw the DOM elements. And this all gets like super confusing. It's like the just JavaScript thing is a little bit of like a white lie in, in React because as you mentioned, JSX kind of screws that all up a little bit. But React knows this function called react.createElement. And you can use this um, in any React app that, that you want. It's, it's what all React apps use. Um, but that gets abstracted into, um, in, in typical apps, into JSX. So where you could say react.createElement, div, and then give it some parameters. Instead, we use this syntax called JSX, which looks a lot like HTML. And you would just write angle bracket, div, and then your parameters as attributes. And the way that is all empowered is through Babel transforms. 
Um, and so every time it sees these angle brackets, it's like, that's not JavaScript. Uh, so you tell Babel like, hey, yeah, that's not JavaScript, it's JSX. And when you see those, just turn it into this function, react.createElement. And once you get the hang of it, it all kind of like makes sense. Um, but if you don't really know that that's what's happening under the hood, it looks super weird because it looks like you just have a function that's returning HTML, which is impossible, as we all know. And uh, yeah, so that's that's what JSX is. And it's not React specific. Um, you could have JSX, you know, by default in Babel, I think it does React.createElement, but you could have that do any any function. It could you know, run the function H or my element or whatever you want. Yeah, that's JSX. And it is, I think, the biggest stumbling block to getting into React um, because beyond looking funny, there are a bunch of kind of weird things like uh, instead of writing class for applying style classes, um, you would write class name uh, instead of four. It's like HTML4 for hooking up form elements. Um, so there's a lot of kind of gotchas like right up front in React with uh, with JSX. So if you are writing JSX, you, you said it looks very similar to HTML, but what you, what's actually happening is it's taking this markup that looks like HTML and it's compiling it down to regular JavaScript code. So instead of writing, let's say, a, um, a div tag in HTML, it's actually creating a JavaScript function call that says react.createElement div, for example. Is, is, that, uh, is that correct? Yeah, so it'll actually create a bunch of objects. And so they're basically just blueprints for what that element would look like. Um, and so it would say like, you know, type is div or, or whatever, and then have, you know, the attributes that would go on there. Let's see, it doesn't do properties because React has its own idea of, of props. Um, but yeah, any like kind of nested children, and it would just build up this big object of all of these elements. And then it would use that to determine which elements need to get inserted to the DOM, which ones have changed, um, et cetera. And what, what are some of the, the benefits of this approach? Like, what are the benefits of having it generate JavaScript code versus the template approach that you were mentioning some other frameworks use? Yeah, that's a great question. I know that one of the things for me is just the practical advantage of having my code and my template in the same place. Uh, I know not, not a lot of people like that, um, but I've found in front-end development, I'm typically changing my, my view and that you know controller or whatever it is that feeds data to the view uh, in tandem. Uh, and so I love that React puts those together. So for me personally, there's a practical advantage of having those co-located. I know that there's, you know, maybe some some speed advantages as to not parsing strings. I couldn't speak to that specifically because I'm not I'm not that bright. I <laughs> I just make views, but I know that there's some uh, you know some theoretical uh, speed advantages to that. Uh, I know that it's it's easier to kind of like diff these objects before uh, they become become views, but that's a little bit outside of my depth. I couldn't speak knowledgeably to the to the performance gains because I know that there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in some of the other libraries where they're pre-compiling a lot of those templates and turning them into functions anyway. So I, I couldn't speak to that side of it. I'm not sure if this has changed recently, but I remembered working with things like Angular 1 in the past where you would write a HTML template and if you would make a mistake when you wrote the template, then the HTML, once you actually looked at the web page, you would just get nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and you would have no idea like what was wrong. <laughs> Whereas I believe with React, when you write the JSX markup, if you make a mistake, I, I think because it compiles down to JavaScript, the tooling can tell you what kind of mistake you made. Yeah, definitely. If you had, if you have a uh, syntax error in any of these, which is um, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, if you have a syntax error, um, it's a lot easier for JavaScript to uh, report that to you when you are um, compiling it because it won't it won't compile, and so you'll you'll get some kind of error, which is really helpful. You know, versus you know in a, a traditional view, if you have like two angle brackets on one side and just one on the other, uh, you really wouldn't know until you ran that code. Right. You run it and then 
you just get a white screen or something like that. Yeah. (laughs) We've all seen those views where it's like you got these like weird curly braces and it's like, hello, first name. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Yeah. (laughs) I want to go a little bit more into the components we were talking about earlier. What kind of information is is stored inside a component? I believe in React, there's things like props and state and things like that. And I was wondering if you could go a little bit more into that. Yeah, absolutely. So you can think of components a lot like functions. At their very base layer, you're going to have, you're going to create a component with a function. So you say function, my component, uh, and then you're going to take only one argument and that's going to be props that's that's a a, an object of of properties we'll come back to that Um, but then that component is just going to return a react element so that could be a a div uh, that could be a, a button it could be any of the html elements or it could be another component now so going back to those those arguments uh so we have props they always come in as an object and in props is kind of a mix of things. It's going to be all of the attributes that your component was called with. So that could be ID, class name, data attributes, all of the regular HTML attributes are going to be in that in that bag of props, that object of props. And then in addition to that, it's going to be any API that you want to support. So let's say we have a greeting component and it has a first name and a last name and you join them together or something like that. Um, You would pass those props into this this object that we get as an argument as to our component as HTML style attributes. So, you know, in JSX, we use this, uh, we're using XML type, type markup and it's going to be, so you would do like first name equals, you know, quotes, Michael or Jeremy, and then, uh, you know, last name and you put your last name in. And so now that passes those onto our component and then the component would then merge those together, render it however it needs. Now that's the, that's one interface for, managing data in react that's the that's the first one so just passing arguments effectively the second one is with state now the other white lie of react is that it's not just a view layer it does also manage state um so you could write an entire application you know from from data fetching to you know to 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 rendering in a react component now a lot of that's changed over the the handful of the, the last year effectively but components can effectively hold on to state as well so if you have you know a simple example of this is just like a click counter you got a button every time you tap on it it just increments a number um so that's that's state a component can hold on to that and the most recent way to do that is through through hooks Um, you would have these, um, you have these like kind of like magic little functions in react that you can stick inside of your, your components that allow you to hook into react and maintain pieces of state. So every time you tap that button, you would kind of tie into this, this hook and, you know, update it with, you know, saying, Hey, increment yourself, increment yourself, and then use data returned from that hook to, to render that number it's all kind of like complicated over over uh over voice it's a right. lot simpler <laughs> if you, uh, it, the react docs have some really good examples specifically the ones that i mentioned and they show these are like two liners effectively but yeah so um components can also have state and um that is anytime a component has state you know it's owned by that component you know the only way to move state around would be to have another component own it and then pass it in as props or you know use some other type of global state library that manages all of that for you Um, but the react method is to the current one is to use a hook and uh, just kind of hold it in a in a component and so just to break it down a little bit you said we have props Uh, the a component is a is a function so it, it takes in these props um, and those props determine what uh, is kind of shown inside the component. And then you have state, which allows changes within the component to be persisted for the duration of, I guess, for the time the person is on the page. The next thing I want to talk a little bit about is, could you give us a, an example of how components react to changes uh, such as things like somebody clicking a button or entering, you know, information into a text field. 
How are the components getting notified of these changes and how is that information getting to the components? Yeah, so React has had this long standing idea of one way data flow. And this is uh, this is kind of like a big concept. I'm not going to go into a lot of it right now, but that if, if you Google anything with inputs, you're going to find you know this term one way data flow. And so we'll touch on that a little bit. But React has its own event system. And so they call these like synthetic events. So if you wanted to hook one of these up on your component, let's say you have like a my input and it's just a you know single input, you could just spit an input out on the page and it'll behave just like, you know, any other other input. Um, but the React way of managing the state for that input field is you would have an on change. You'd, you'd put an on change prop on that thing and you would give it a function. Now with hooks, you actually get that function. So you if you used a state hook, it would return an update function and then also the current state. Um, and so you would kind of hook both of those things up onto your input. So you would say, hey, on click, call my hook function, which ups, updates this piece of state. And then the value is going to be the piece of state that we get from that hook. So that's kind of like how we would hook things up in, in React. Now, this gets a little bit complicated because, um, first of all, you can just use like the regular regular inputs without kind of managing the state. Um, but then also many React apps will use a totally different library to manage the state of these elements. So, you know, that might be Redux. Uh, they might use a form library specifically that has its own way of doing it. But the the built in mechanism is to use some type of, you know, use state hook or use reducer hook. Um, and what those do is they provide you the again, they hook into React. They provide you the the current state and they provide you a function for updating that state, both of which you would wire up to your React element. And this gives you the, what React developers kind of refer to as like this one way data flow um, where the component doesn't update its own value. It calls a function which updates the state somewhere else and then uses that returned value to uh, to display the output. You know, it's it's funny. I'm realizing as we're talking why so many people find React complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's like the example you're giving with uh, just a input, like a, a text input, right? If someone was building a traditional form without, say, a, a framework, they would type whatever they want to type into the form, and they would submit it, and the browser would kind of automatically pull out whatever the user had typed into that field, right? Whereas it sounds like with React, the typical way you would make that work is you would have to add an event to the input field that is basically saying like call this uh, event every time somebody types something new into the input field and then you would have a function that is being passed in to that component that is updating its state i guess based off of these on change events and then that state would be passed back into the component to make the input change based off of props. Did I kind of get that Correct. right? Or okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you did get that right. And it is all in in service of kind of protecting that prop boundary, so that things are told what to do. They don't have some secret knowledge of like how they're hooked up into the system. Um, and so React really does try very hard to be explicit about relationships. And so having that like kind of one way data flow and like basically asking to update and then getting your new state via props kind of allows you to control the application in a very fine grained way. Now, I think you, you bring up a really interesting point um, because this isn't required. This would be something that would empower you to make highly interactive forms. So like, you know, as this piece of state changes, now we're using that data, not just to update the value of the input, but maybe modify some other fields in a different way. If you wanted to just have like a straight inputs and then have, um, you know, on submit, take that data and do something with it, um, you can totally do that as well. You could just have a simple form and then have a, you know, form element, do on submit and then give that 
a function for handling all of those that that entire form um, when you're done with it. And you could put that in state if you wanted to, or you could, you know, just use that data to fire off some type of, you know, a s- server query or, you know, whatever you want. Um, but yeah, you could handle that with a, a less complex form doing that just on the, the form element itself. So it kind of gives you the option, like they have these ways of doing it using props and state. But if you decide that you don't want React to manage that part of your application, you can still use the the regular DOM, I guess, and write your app kind of how you would normally write it. Totally. Yeah. You could basically everything in that form could feel very familiar. You don't have to use any of the special attributes. And then on submit would be the only place where you're really interacting with React. And say like, hey, this this form's complete. I have all this data now, you know, do something with it. Got it. One of the things people say with React is that its components are composable. How does React help you build out your UI and sort of using components? Yeah. So it's it's really f- fascinating how many ways you can compose elements together when you have the full power of JavaScript behind you. And that's one of my favorite things about React is because at the end of the day, these elements are an artifact of, you know, however you want to compose these functions together to 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 make them. So there are a ton of patterns that you can use to compose components together. And you know, the most basic of this of these is going to be a component that creates an element from another component. So you have maybe a greeting component and it just renders an h1 with, you know, hi your name. Well, then you can have a header component that use that renders that greeting component along with other components. So that would be, a, you know, the first kind of form of, of composition that you can create components that render other components. So that's that's really handy because now you only have to do that greeting once and you can use it in a bunch of other components to 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 compose new views together. However, you can also use components to compose views and data. So you could have a component that is only responsible for gathering data. So you you say, hey, uh, when this component's rendered, go fetch this data from the the, the server, and uh, we want you to then take that and render whatever component we give to you as props. So you could pass a component in as props and say, render this component with the data that you have. Um, so that would be another way that you could compose components together now in a way that allows you to merge data and views. Um, and there are just like a ton of patterns that you can use for composing these things together. There is an API called Context. And what the what Context allows you to do is it allows you to set a bunch of values um, that you could use inside of all of these components by just like basically just grabbing them out of the air. So it's kind of a third mechanism for uh, for for data. So it props um, state in context is a way of like distributing data to a whole tree. So I could say like, you know, user context, I could create a context for all of the um, for my user, which has their name, their you know birth date and uh, favorite food or something. And then when I use that context, when I wrap a certain part of my subtree in context, I can then just snatch those da- those those pieces of data out of the air in my components without having to pass them around as props. Uh, and this can be a really, really nice way of composing related components. So ones that you know are always going to have access to certain types of data. Um, and instead of having to pass them around as props, just uh, basically you put them in the air of this subtree. They're kind of like local local variables to, to that part of your, your application. And then they just, uh, you can just grab them out of the air and like, oh, hey, I know the first name is in the air somewhere. I'm going to grab that and use that when I don't have any props. So, um, yeah, so these are those are a bunch of ways that you can you can compose components together. I mean, there's because it's JavaScript, there's really like endless ways that you could compose components together. Um, but those are just some of the most the most uh, common composing views of views, composing data and views together. And um, and then also using context to uh, to create views that are aware of certain pieces of data. Kind of like how with traditional HTML, you know, we had 
tags that could just give us an input or give us a button. And this sort of is like taking it to the next step where we could create, like you said, a let's say a greeting component, um, or we can create a survey component. We can create these building blocks that have not just markup, but also have behavior associated with them. And, and we can have a component that's made up of a set of child components. So we kind of get all these little pieces that we can connect together when we're building an application. And we can even possibly reuse components that we used on one application and use them with another one. Yeah, absolutely. So so one of the things that I do for my work is I work on a design system and a component library that we share between eight applications. And the composability of React components really comes in handy for, for me in allowing other people to kind of use the components that they need without having to do a lot of customization. So uh, if, if you use something like Bootstrap or Bulma, a lot of times they'll have an API that's like button and then button is link or button is primary or button is whatever. And so all of these all of these customizations or modifications exist inside of the namespace of button. Now, React kind of flips that on its head a little bit. And so in a React-based component library, we can have at the very bottom, we can have a button. And the button is basically just renders out a button attribute. And maybe we do something like uh, type equals button by default, which it should be by default anyway. So we, we do that, and that's our button component. Well, now we can we can compose other components over that. And so we can do something like we could have like a red button and it just like applies a class or applies some styles or, or however we want to do it. And now this is a red button. Now we don't want to write like red button everywhere in our app because you know, it, it's better to refer to things semantically, right? Like, so maybe this deletes something. So then we can compose that again. And we say like a delete button is a red button, which is a button. So kind of it, it cascades a little bit. So we have a delete button is red button is a button. Now at some point in the future, we say like, well, actually we don't want our, our you know, we, we, we find red to be offensive. We want it to be something like, you know, pink instead. Um, well, now we can just kind of like swap that out with pink button or, you know, have our delete button just call button directly or render button directly and then apply the style attributes that it wants. But these are some really nice tools of being able to like compose, swap out pieces that that, that don't work for us anymore without having to overload this base button with a bunch of props and knowledge about the entire system. Very cool. So it's we're building tools that are not just for the app we're currently working on. It could be something that could be applied across our company, or it could even be something like, uh, let's say somebody had built like a, a chart library or something. And that's something that you could build out and build an API in terms of what props you accept and what kinds of um, functions are made available. And that's something you could put online and release it as an open source library. And now other people could use that chart component in you know their own application, that sort of thing. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and one thing I love about the React component model is that in these open source projects, something I'm seeing a lot is that you, know, you, you build the first version of your chart and it's gonna have, everything's gonna be profit based, presumably. And the natural inclination is, you know, when someone needs a feature, they're going to ask for a new prop to do that thing. And that's that's great, like for a certain period of time until a year down the road. Now you have like 50 props that you could pass in and it's just super confusing to use use this library. And what I've seen a lot of people do because of this composable nature of React is say like, hey, Instead of giving you extra props, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to keep this default interface the way that it is. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to expose the the inside parts of this as 
other components. So you need to change this thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give that to you as a component, um, and then you can change that thing and then recompose them together as your own chart. So I'm going to give you all the pieces that I use to build my chart, and now you have access to those. You can customize them however you want. You could replace them with your own if you want to, and uh, and then build build your own chart from those same composable pieces. And um, I'm seeing this transformation in a lot of the React open source um, projects. And it's just such a great way to, I guess, work in the same sandbox because, you know, we've all seen projects start out with a really simple interface and then get a really complex, you know, overrun interface with with a bunch of customization. It's really nice to be able to just say like, hey, that that default interface doesn't work for me. So I'm just going to pull these pieces out and then use those to compose my own interface. Nice. Yeah, that sounds really powerful. And uh, I have definitely come across uh, APIs and maybe even built some myself where there's so many kind of public props or calls uh, <laughs> where it just is very difficult to to get started. So I, I think that's really cool that you can build with that in mind and kind of offload some of that to the user of the component. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people call this the uh, prop calypse. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. This is a silly little React, uh, React community pun yeah, for you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about how someone can get started with React. First, when should a team consider introducing React? Like what kinds of questions should they ask themselves? I think that it depends on where you're coming from. Uh, so I, I can speak from my experience. The team that I work with, we had eight Rails applications. And um, Rails is a great platform and they're constantly adding to it and or great framework. And they have some really great tools um, for kind of managing uh, your, your server side application and then doing some front end JavaScript stuff. Unfortunately, the tools that were available a handful of years ago weren't great for highly interactive JavaScript where you make a change over here and then updates immediately over here. Um, they can be a little bit complicated and um, indirect. So I think that that was a natural inflection point for us um, to say, hey, we have these views that are highly interactive and we want to give the user immediate feedback. Um, that was the point where we started looking at React Specifically, we had an application that was kind of, it was almost like an, an event runner. I mean, it, it is an event runner uh, where you would have this rundown of all the things that are going to happen in, in, in an event. So think like a meetup and you know that, you know, seven o'clock, someone's given an introduction at 715. You got your first talk. You got a little bit of a break for food. And then, you know, you, you got your second talk and then everybody goes home. And we had this tool that would allow you to see the progression of the event, see the upcoming things. Uh, it had a real time chat hooked up into it. Um, you could progress events if they kind of fired off early or kind of ran too long or ended ended early. And so this is a very highly interactive thing. And this really wasn't something that we could do in Rails because these app updates, you know, with the clock, they were at least happening every second. So we just decided to go full bore into to React. So this is just a single React application. The nice thing is it was totally isolated, right? We just built a small application and then we serve it at that route in our Rails app. And um, it was totally isolated from the rest of our application. React hadn't really, we hadn't made a decision to use React, you know, across the application. Uh, we just said, hey, this, this is a good place for React and used it in that one place and kind of tried really uh, tried really hard to just kind of like have that be a decision point for the rest of the app. Like, do we need it? Do we need to have high interactivity um, in this application? Do we have an endpoint that we're interacting with already set up? Um, those are some questions that I found um, really helpful in deciding whether or not it was time to embrace React. Um, now, it's you know five or six years later, uh, and I think that, that that decision point has maybe moved up a little bit. I think there's a lot of people who are starting in, you know, their app is already uh, very heavy on the client side. I think that that is going to be a little bit more of a difficult question. You know, if you, let's say you already have an Ember app or you already have an Angular app, when do you make the decision to, you know, maybe give React a try? I couldn't, I couldn't answer that one 
per se, but I would say find a piece that can, can be completely owned by React and just start there and see how it feels and see if that can naturally grow into other parts of the application. And in this example that you're giving, did you use React to control an entire page or was it a traditional server rendered page that had React components on parts of it? Yeah, so this was um, the the fir- our first experiment with React was it is just it was just a page. So we had a Rails route, and that route just had that single DOM node, and we said, "Hey, React, render yourself here." And the whole application was basically just one gigantic component because mm. this was you know five or six years ago, and we didn't understand how like composition worked. I, I mean, I don't think the industry really understood how composition <laughs> worked. So we had this. I mean, I think. It was maybe like a 1500 line component with maybe another 2000 lines of, of, of mix-ins, uh, which was an API that they had at the time to basically force in other components into your component. Thank God they've gotten rid of it now. Yeah. So it was, it was probably like, it was effectively like a 3000 line component. Wow. (laughs) I guess one thing I would ask is if somebody is in sort of a similar situation where they have a traditional server rendered page and there's a portion of that page that has some kind of complicated user interaction like for example um, let's say you have a page that that has a form that is very complicated and you want to do a lot of client-side validation that sort of thing Mm -hmm. would you take the approach you did where the route just had a single dom node that react kind of took over or would you have the majority of the page still be a uh, rendered traditionally and then just make that one form or that one section be made with react components yeah that's a great question so one of the cool things is that because react only needs a a dom node um, i think either approach is is valid and th- that that second approach that you mentioned is what we ended up taking in a lot of other places in our application once we decided that react was a good fit for a company we would basically say like, hey, this one, like you said, this form is highly interactive and we want to be able to control that and give immediate feedback to the user. And so we would just render a, a DOM node there that we could you know, render our React application to and then um, you know, just do that. And it was you know, in the context of a Rails rendered view, um, everything else had remained the same, but we were able to just kind of convert that one node into this interactive form. And I think that that's a that's a great approach as well. When you're sort of making that decision, what are some of the pros and cons of taking the isolated components strategy versus having React take care of the entire page? Whew. I know for me, I don't like to rewrite stuff rewrite the same code in a different language. So so for me, I would be hard pressed to want to just take that entire view, one that's already working, one that's already tested, and then convert the whole thing just because. Uh, so for me, I always like to take the smallest possible chunk and then have it naturally grow. And I think that's one thing I really love about React is, is that while some frameworks are very opinionated, you know, they need to be, they need to control the whole page. Uh, React is not. And, um, you know, one of the, the beautiful things of that is, is that you can decide how much of your application you have to rewrite to get the interactive parts that you want. So yeah, I would always recommend, you know, if you're doing any type of transformation, React or not, um, to start with the smallest amount of like, the smallest piece possible and um, and then kind of like see how that grows. I know some people really can't handle the incongruity of that, but I don't know. I would I would just recommend, you know, training yourself to <laughs> to to have more of that in your life because every application has has some degree of that and being able to live with you know different mindsets and you know different uh, frameworks is just kind of part of working on on valuable production code yeah so i guess you would say to basically be very targeted like start small if you have something that's working just change the part that you think could use that extra interactivity and don't worry so much about having to sort of 
be between two worlds, I guess, you know, having, yeah. having to understand the, the Rails view as well as the React view, you, you, you don't consider that to be an issue. You think that's something that most people will have to deal with. Yeah, well, I think that there's a lot of things that we just, we just don't think about when we are inclined toward a rewrite. So, you know, some of those things are, you know, maybe a lot of that view is already tested. Um, and so now you have to redo all of those tests, you know, and it's not, and so it's not just changing the view, you're, you're changing the tests. And then also, you know, in, in the case of moving from something like rails to react, those tests are changing frameworks and approaches. And I think that those types of things we tend to, I guess, like brush out of our mind when we're thinking about, oh, it'd be fun to redo this thing in React. Uh, we forget about all of the things that wrap that view that we've already established. And, you know, I think those are the things that kind of come back to bite us at that like 80% mark. You know, like we've already got, we, we've got all the functionality, but now we have to backfill all the tests that we've you know deleted now and all that kind of stuff and that's like that part is just like soul crushing when you get there and you're like oh man we've we've made a mistake <laughs> we should have just did, we should have done a smaller piece of this thing totally i mean it's when you you have something that works you know especially if it's been a while and you've established like you know, we, we put this stuff out, we have our tests, it's been running in production and, you know, we're good. Like that's, that's something very powerful. Right. And you don't really want to give that up. Oh yeah. Never. <laughs> yeah. It's like, those were hard won battles. Like I don't want to fight them again. Yeah, for sure. So another thing I'd, I'd like to ask about is if you have something like a Google maps page, that's not built in react does it still make sense to use React in your application for that page? Like, how would you approach that? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So React does have some escape hatches for you to be able to render some type of JavaScript thing, you know, so in this case, a map that isn't React and to be able to um, to, to render that without having it, having to re-implement it in React. And so there's, there's a few... APIs for this, depending on what you need. Um, but effectively, you can kind of force something into any of these nodes. So there, there's some videos on Egghead that I've seen uh, where people are demonstrating how you could use um, jQuery UI calendar widgets inside of React. And uh, it might be a little bit too complicated to try to, you know, verbalize over the air. Sure. But there are escape hatches for that. Um, I, I know that one of them was it dangerously set in our HTML. Mm. <laughs> so you, um, so there's an API that you can use that allows you to basically just tell a node in React, hey, this is the HTML you have to render. As React, we're not controlling it. We're just giving you a big string and you're going to render that into the DOM. Um, so that's one of the escape patches that you can use. Um, sometimes you can use the lifecycle events to basically, you know, give the thing an ID and then render um, render whatever it is that you need to to that ID once it's already in the uh, established to be in the DOM. Um, depending on what approach you need to take and what the life cycle of the library you're using is, there, there are absolutely approaches that you can use to kind of encapsulate that into a component as like the jQuery UI calendar React component that just opts out and uses jQuery UI. Mm -hmm. Next, I'd like to talk about how to get started with React because mm -hmm. I think React, like you've sort of been saying throughout our conversation, a lot of times people say it's just the view layer. But I think what people often find out is to get started with React, there's all these other things they have to learn or there's all these starter kits yeah. that people recommend. And so it can get really overwhelming. So how would you recommend someone get started? Like, what are the things they should focus on? Yeah, that's a great question. One of my favorite tools today is called Code Sandbox. And Code Sandbox is totally set up out of, they, they have a, a playground for React apps. And everything that you need to get started is in there. So if you want to just start playing with React and you know that you're going to have some trouble, you know, getting getting, you know, Babel set up for uh, JSX and and all of those things that are kind of side effects of playing with React. Uh, if you just want to play with it and get a sense of it, 
Code Sandbox is amazing. They have a Re React project. You just click a button and then boom, you're, you're set up in a React app. You can then go through all the tutorials. You can follow along in the documentation. It's amazing. So that's, that's the first thing. And you can do pretty much anything that you would do. You can, you know, you can npm install different packages. Um, you can make requests to, uh, to 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 various data services, and um, it's it's really good. Uh, when I do trainings, I will usually use Code Sandbox because it takes all of the setup out of it. Um, beyond that, there's a couple starters that I think are better than others. Facebook maintains a project called Create React App. Unfortunately, it does require that you have at least a, a base level command of node because all of this stuff happens in a node process. In, in, in fact, the, the code sandbox um, starter is based on create react app. So the next step would be, you know, to go from your, your uh, code sandbox starter to create react app because it's the same environment effectively. Um, but now you have to use node. Um, so you'd have to install node. You'd have to kind of get a sense of NPM install and NPM installing a create React app. Fortunately, they've made it very easy. But I'd say that that's one of the next best places to go because it's kind of spiritually connected to the, the code sandbox. Uh, they've made it easy. The documentation is great. And um, all those things like, you know, JSX and um, things that you might not even think of, you know, if you want to load an SVG or you want to load styles um, from CSS or something else, all of those are taken care of. They've given you um, well-documented, nice APIs. They've, they've connected all, done all the connective tissue to make sure that that works for you. And then the third thing is something that I use all the time. I don't I don't personally use Create React App when I'm starting a project, um, but there's a company called Zite, and they have a project called Next.js, and it's it's kind of a static site generator, kind of, but I find it to be the easiest way to actually like just get started with React, and I really love Next. It's like a you npm install two things, and now everything in uh, anything that you put in a pages directory um, becomes like a React page and um, you can do do all kinds of cool stuff with that so that's one of my my that's my personal favorite uh, starting point with with react um, but code sandbox definitely uh, give that a try and uh, create react app is probably your next step once you've uh, you've decided to make the jump into uh, using using a little bit of node to control your your app build and earlier you had talked about how when you and your team first started using React, it was in the context of an existing server rendered application. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to use, say, Create React App or uh, Next.js in combination with that? Or what, what would be the approach for someone in that situation? Yeah, so a lot of frameworks will have some type of plugin or, or gem or you know whatever the, the mechanism is for your framework to connect a, a React app. So, so uh, Rails, I know, has generators now by default where you can um, generate a React app or a Vue app or an Elm app inside of Rails. I am not too familiar with the other frameworks, but I, I imagine that now it's it's probably pretty simple in a lot of the major frameworks like you know Python or .NET um, to get started with a uh, with some type of generated Rails con uh, React configuration. Another thing I'd like to ask is, when someone is learning React, there are going to be a lot of resources they see that use features that maybe aren't widely used anymore or maybe have better alternatives now. What are the things that someone should avoid when they're looking up tutorials and looking up guides? What, what are the features that they maybe don't need to consider anymore? So the last year has marked a lot of change. And a lot of that change is um, around hooks. So I'd, I'd mentioned uh, hooks uh, earlier in our conversation, but hooks are really the the new like do it all kind of collection of APIs in React. Um, so React has had a lot of, I guess, ways of defining components. And right now, the 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 happy path is you just do function style components. So it's just a function that wraps a you know a React element. And now when you want to do things like you know connect to data or have some kind of side effect where you 
maybe change a class outside of your React app in the DOM, or you know, using context, um, which which we had talked about earlier, using state. All of these kinds of things are now wrapped up in hooks. And the beauty of hooks is that you can use them in function components, um, which are the simplest to define. It's just a com- function that re- cre- returns a React element. And um, now you can just use these. You can you know connect to state. You can connect to the outside world and update classes or wh- whatever you want to do, connect to data. And all of that can happen in hooks now. That used to be a lot more complicated when we had a class API for defining components and you had to know a bunch of lifecycle methods to kind of uh, connect to to state and whatnot. So if you don't have to, if you're not working in a legacy app that is using the class component APIs, I think that really using the function style components and React hooks is, is where you want to be. Push as hard as you can to be living in that wonderland um, because those APIs are great. They're so well thought out. They're much easier to use. And if you're just starting out right now, I wouldn't even bother with the other ones um, because, you know, so many libraries now are using hooks. It's really a lot. You can get very far without even having to learn the other, uh, the, the class style and kind of all the resulting methods of composing components that were birthed out of that. Um, so yeah, so function components hooks and, um, yeah, I would just, I would just start with that, do everything you can in that. And then I know that, you know, sometime over the next year, there's going to be a new API called suspense, or I, I think it exists now, but nobody's really using it because the tools aren't there to use it, but that is going to be the best way to connect to data. And, um, it's, it's really geared around giving users great experiences when they're waiting for data or when those requests fail. And, you know, that's a conversation for another time because it's, you know, it's all still being figured out. But suspense is going to be the way to connect to data in the future. And um, it, it looks amazing. To basically summarize, like a lot of the things that people will be dealing with are going to be uh, props and state and context and you said basically to look for solutions that use hooks for all of those things Mm -hmm. and avoid things that are using say class components at this point yeah i think so much of the the react world is going to there there's there's been a a couple people who've gone gone on record saying that like there's going to be two eras of react you know the pre-hooks and post hooks and i think that's true i think that they have found the the missing piece to really simplify a lot of our app code. And um, yeah, if you're getting started today, uh, you're just going to be delighted by how easy hooks are compared to maybe every other time you've looked at React. Another thing is there are a lot of libraries for things like routing or authentication Things where when somebody is building their application using React, they may not know where to start. So are there like a list of recommended libraries or components that you recommend people use when they're first getting started? Yeah, so React Router is great. I think that um, you know they've they've put a lot of care into that. Um, there's a blog post now. I, I know that there was a little bit of a split for a moment, and there's a there was a Reach Router. Uh, they're they've um, they're working together again to make the next version of React Router. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the de facto choice as far as routing goes. There are a bunch of styling libraries i'd say that if you if you really wanted to avoid writing css um, which you don't have to i write css all the time i love it there are some styling libraries the most popular ones are styled components and emotion uh so those are the two there uh i'm trying to think about like what else i would like recommend across the board i mean really once i have a router once i have some styling solution if you have the option of using a GraphQL endpoint, Apollo does seem to be Apollo client seems to be the the one that everyone loves in terms of uh, connecting to uh, connecting to a GraphQL data source. 
So yeah, you'd probably have to figure out how to how to connect to data. There's a bunch of components out there that allow you to use a hook or whatnot to fetch data from a RESTful endpoint as well. I, I couldn't say that there's like a universal winner, but there are a bunch out there. Yeah, I think that would be, you know, that'd be my starting point. I like to I like to keep it really simple, but you know, React Router is a, a must for me. So start with something like create React app or Next.js and then the router and then style components and Apollo if you're using GraphQL. And basically just start with that and don't worry about anything else. Like get started with those and see what you can build with that. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and one cool thing about Next is that it actually has a router built in. So because it uses the file system as like an API for, for routes, any additional folders that you put into the pages directory get their own routes. Um, so you actually don't have to think about routing at all and it works on server side or client. It's um it's pretty amazing. So like when I don't want to think about routing, I just use Next and it's it it does everything that I want. One thing that I did want to touch on that I get a lot of questions about is when people are learning React, they often also start learning Redux or think they need to start learning Redux. I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on whether that's something people should look at or whether that's something that's overkill, kind of what your thoughts are on. Yeah, I can only say that I have never used Redux. Uh, So I've built a ton of applications. And for me, just the, the state management in React was enough. Uh, So I think that you can get really far without using Redux. One of the really neat things about Redux, there's two really cool things about Redux. And, you know, one is is that it really teaches you how to use, uh, how to manage state with immutable uh, concepts. Um, And so so I think that there's some really good valuable lessons to learn there from Redux. And then the second thing is that there's a huge community around Redux. So there's a ton of middleware that already exists um, that you can just kind of NPM install and take advantage of. Um, and there's some great developer tools um, that you can take advantage of. But I feel like if you're not going to take advantage of those, uh, Redux can be extremely cumbersome. And I think ultimately the the thing that Redux you know gave us f- four years ago um, has effectively been brought into React via context, and there's a use reducer hook. Um, so those were really the two core innovations of Redux, and those exist in in React now as first class documented you know components. So I really don't think that I mean personally, just from from my experience, uh, I I really don't think that people should jump into React and Redux at the same time. Like I think that that's always a bad idea. People don't really get a good sense of where the boundaries are when they when they do them simultaneously. However, I don't think Redux is bad if, if it is a good fit for your team and it, it provides you with um, with structures that. Uh, help you build better software, then I think that's great. Um, but I think that, you know, I think that there's a lot of stuff in React now that I would maybe try as a first uh, first step um, and then kind of see if, you know, you need to take that next step in Redux. Nice. The last thing I'd like to kind of sum up with is testing with React components. How is testing in React different than how front-end testing has traditionally been done? Yeah, I would say... It's it's not markedly different. I think that anytime you have like you know asynchronous behaviors, you really have to do um, you have to use some kind of framework that's you know integrated. You have some use some type of testing framework that's at least a little bit integrated with the library itself, so it knows when those events have have resolved. I know for me, I don't personally do a lot of like application testing. Uh, I would say uh, Kent. C Dodds has a really great course. I think it's just like testing JavaScript or something. dot uh, com. He's done a bunch to really like dive into that space. Uh, I know for me, I usually like to test, even though it's a little bit slower. I like to test from like the most outside point when I'm doing views. So I use Cypress, which is just an end to end tester. It basically just fires up your app in a browser, and um, you know it has, um, and you just kind of like say, hey, this thing's here. Uh, focus it type this thing and hit submit and you know what what resulted that's the approach that i typically like to take just because i know it's the most fail safe in terms of mapping to the experience the user is going to get um, but you know there's trade-offs a lot of people like to uh, test a little bit closer to you know the components and that's that's fine too awesome so 
to kind of wrap up, do you have any questions I didn't ask or any advice you'd like to give? Oh, man. You know, I think just have fun. I know that there's so much material out there and a lot of it comes from different eras of React and that can be really challenging to navigate. I think that if you stick to stuff that helps you with functional compo- or function components and hooks, uh, you're going to be, you're going to have a really good experience. So uh, the documentation is really good. I recommend, uh, you know, checking it out there. I, I, I have a show called React Podcast, and I try as much as I can to have it be uh, beginner friendly. And so we have, you know, a lot of experts talking about all kinds of stuff. So, you know, GraphQL, Hooks, uh, React Router, a bunch of stuff that applies to open source, like versioning, animation in React. Uh, we just had some episodes on that. And um, yeah, so if, you, if you're interested in React and hearing from a lot of people who are kind of making it happen... Um, I think that that's, that's where I do a lot of my learning. And so hopefully other people can learn along with me. Yeah, I've listened to a lot of the episodes and it's really a great resource. I mean, you get to hear from the people who are basically building the future of React, are building the components, building the libraries, and you really learn a lot. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks. Finally, so how can people follow you or follow the React podcast? Yeah, so um, I am... Chantastic on uh, on you know Twitter I guess and some other places. Uh, I've started doing a little bit more writing on Dev two. I'm trying to get uh, in with that community. But yeah, Chan uh, Chantastic on Twitter is probably the the, the best connection point. Um, I link to a lot of my my writing. I have a a small resource called React Patterns that I'm going to be kind of reworking to uh, or it's ReactPatterns.com. I'm going to be reworking that to to start showing off hooks. Um, and so hopefully that'll be, um, it's been a really helpful resource to get some uh, newcomers into React in the past. And I'm hoping that I can uh, refresh it to be that same resource for people today. Awesome. Well, Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Jeremy. This has been super fun. This has been Jeremy Jung for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.